Test, testing one, two. Good morning, Mountainside. Welcome to worship today. We are so happy that you're here. I see some familiar faces back in here, and I see some visitors. Where if you're visiting with us today, you're in for a treat. Maria is going to be bringing her message. Her pastor's out traveling. He had a wedding to perform last night in Mississippi. I was going to say Alabama. I knew I was getting close down there. Uh, so they should be on their way back, I guess, sometime today. Uh, we are so thankful that you're here uh, to worship with us today. And then if, like I said, if you're visiting, I invite you to come back to hear um, Pastor Doug uh, when he brings his message. And we are so excited for Maria to be stepping in for him and look forward to what she's going to bring us um, here in a few minutes. The only announcement we have is the ladies' fellowship breakfast in the morning at 8.30 at Deborah's. Be there or be square. And I've been told that you can, you know, one day you might just get up early because all of us retired folks like to sleep in, I understand. But, uh, breakfast at 8.30, we hope that you show up and come. And for the fellowship fun. Uh, my wife will be there, so, you know, it'll be fun, no matter what it is. Uh, that way. <laughs> uh, that's the only announcement I have. Does anybody else have anything to bring that we need to mention? I invite you to stand and greet one another in Christian fellowship. Yes, one. everybody this morning. Did y'all have a good week? I'll take that as a yes. Here we go. Sing with us. Come on. Now is the time.
worshiping, worshiping with us at Mountainside Church this morning. That song talking about coming to God for worship. Also, we've all had times where we've carried burdens and just lost our way. This next song is called Run to the Father. If you are in one of those times or have ever been or know someone who is, share this song with them. But right now we ask that you sing along and worship with us. And let this be your prayer this morning. You've carried a burden for too long on my own. wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. But I see it now, lay it down. I know that I need you. I've run to the Father. I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. You saw my condition. Yes, this is the time that we run to the Father again and again to give him all the praise and worship, but also to share our concerns. You see on the bulletin um, the, uh, all those that have been listed for prayers, but are there any other prayer requests that we could pass on to the pastor? Any other prayer requests that we can lift up to God today? Yes. Steve Wright has COVID. Okay. So lift him up. Any others? I'm sorry, am I buzzing? Yes, Pat. Who's this? Colleen. Col okay, Colleen. Colleen. Okay, also COVID. Okay. Any others? 
Well, I'm Maria. <laughs> I'm not Doug. But let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can come into your presence boldly, that through the blood of Christ, we have entrance into your very throne room, that we can come to you with every burden, with every stress, with every need that we have, which are many. Father, for those that are on the, the prayer list and those that have been mentioned today, may they feel your comfort more than ever. May they f receive your healing touch. May they have the peace that passes all understanding in difficult situations. Father, we are burdened with all that is going on in this world. And we know that you're fully aware of each situation. So we just lift, it, lift this up to you, knowing that your timing, everything is in your control. Help us to not be anxious. Help us to rest in you in all that is happening in our lives personally as well as in the world around us. Holy Spirit, I thank you for being present here, for helping us to know the Father, to walk with the Father in fullness, in peace, and in joy. And as we come together as a body of Christ to say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go to the Lord now and, and worship with our tithes and offering, Thank you. please receive this prayer. Most gracious God, we celebrate the gifts that you have given us for our church, the, your talents, your faithful attendance. We are so thankful. Father, we ask you to be with this, our gifts, may it multiply and do the work here at Mountainside Church. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh oh. Are we supposed to go up here? Mm -hmm. Where's Matt? Oh, I didn't turn it off. Lift your head, weary sinner, the river's just ahead. Down the path of forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You built a mighty fortress, ten thousand burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to
speaking to me today and I promise God will show up let's pray specifically right now for Maria as she brings this message we thank you so much for her heart to come and share your word we love you we thank you Give us of our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whoops. I am on, right? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, my earpiece. <laughs> well, good morning. I want to begin by thanking Doug for the privilege of bringing this message to you today. It's a message that's been an important part of my own walk with God that I've had to apply multiple times. And also a message that's been an important part of my life as a Christian counselor. The message that I chose to share with you today um, has the analogy that Jesus uses as analogy of the keys to the kingdom of heaven. It's a very well-known passage, and it uh, comes uh, from the message of, uh, in Matthew. So let's begin by reading the scripture in Matthew. And this is Matthew 16, verse 13 through 19. And may you hear. Christ's words through the scriptures today. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, 
Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. And I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This scripture has many interpretations. But most of the time, we focus on those first verses at 15 through 18, in which Peter makes that profound profession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, and the Son of God. And Jesus makes it clear that those words, that, that revelation was not something Peter had come up with his, himself. It was a gift a revelation directly from the Father in heaven. And that that truth, that great, wonderful truth that Jesus was the Messiah is the very foundation of the church, the body of Christ, and the entrance into the kingdom of God. On the screen, which I forgot to mention, <laughs> if you would go back to the screen, you saw keys, and as we all know, keys have a dual function, right? We use them to lock our homes, any place that we value, that we want to keep safe. So we lock them when we leave in order to protect what is valuable to us, whether it's church, office, you know, all the places we value. But the dual function, the additional function, is to unlock then when we need to enter that sacred place, that place that is of value to us. So it doesn't surprise me that Jesus used the analogy of a key. Because as we go through the scripture, um, you'll see how the analogy of key fits to the message I'm going to share today. After Jesus pronounced Peter, uh, or after Peter's pronouncement of blessing, um, he, he, Jesus blessed him and said, blessed are you, Peter, because this foundational truth was so important. 1 John 5 tells us, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Then Jesus followed his pronouncement of blessing with three significant promises. First of all, that the gates of hell, the comings and goings of Satan, would not ever overcome this foundational truth that he established and that he would give him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And with those keys, whatever is bound is bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So to unlock the truth of those words, the very important words that Jesus gave, spoke to Peter, and therefore speaking to us, to unlock them, no pun intended. I want to answer three questions. First of all, what do the keys represent? What did Jesus mean when he said, I give you the keys? Second of all, what is their purpose and function? And third of all, by whom and to whom were they given? 
So let's start with what do the keys represent? For those of you that attend the Bible studies I lead, if I don't understand a word or it's kind of, yeah, confusing, I go to the Greek meaning. And so I want to look at the Greek meanings of the words that Jesus used. Because again, there's a lot of different uh, interpretations that have been applied to those words. The Greek meaning of to bind is to be in bonds, knit, be loved, to beg, binding oneself, and petition. And then loose is to loosen, break up, destroy, and put off. I'm going to start with the word loose. And in order to make maybe a little more sense of that word, I want to um, share another encounter which is recorded in the Gospel of John, verse 20, verse 19 through 23, in which Jesus had a, another uh, encounter with the disciples, in which he kind of used a similar uh, command and dialogue. So I'm going to read that to you. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, the Greek meaning of forgiveness is to lay aside, put away, set free. So when we put those two words together, loose and forgive, they seem to have a pretty similar meaning, don't they? It's both putting away, laying aside, dissolving. So what do the keys represent? I have come to believe that the meaning of the keys that Jesus spoke of is the act and the authority to forgive. So let's go to the second. What is then the function? of the keys or forgiveness, the act and the authority to forgive. Just like keys have a twofold function to unlock or lock, forgiveness also has a twofold function. And we don't often think of it in this way. So the first function is when we recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, because Jesus paid the price for our sin, that we can go to God, petition him for his forgiveness. We then, by, by asking forgiveness and receiving the forgiveness that we have through Christ, through him paying the penalty for our sin, it unlocks the door of heaven. He said, I give you the keys of heaven. It unlocks our new home, our new dwelling place that has been prepared for us in eternity. And I don't believe it's just when we die. We already are part of the kingdom of heaven. We've already received it. Our sins are put away, dissolved, and we are now knit in bonds together with God, Jesus, and each other. What a wonderful thought. And we are his beloved. Grasp that. We are God's beloved. These are all the Greek meanings of forgiveness. So that's the first part. The second part, forgiveness loosens the hold, destroys the power of sin and death, and sets us free from the kingdom of Satan, the enemy. 
and it locks the door against his fiery schemes. Notice in Matthew, Jesus' words of promise, the gates of hell cannot prevail or overcome it. That truth, nothing can overpower that truth. And the it being, the church, the body of Christ, and each one of us as his disciples. This is the good news we all celebrate, don't we? And hopefully thank God for. But that takes us to the third question. By whom and to whom are the keys given? And for what purpose? Scripture makes it clear that Jesus, when he walked this earth, earth had full authority to forgive. It's interesting to me also that in the last book of the scriptures, the book of Revelation, we see Jesus again with a key, a key to the pit of hell, which he unlocks. And then after Satan and all his angels and demons are cast into it, he locks it for eternity. Can I hear a hallelujah? Praise the Lord on that one, right? We can't wait. <laughs> But also in both passages, in Matthew and John, we see that that authority that Jesus had, he gave to his disciples. In Matthew, he said, I give you the keys, and whatever you loose in, on earth is loosed in heaven. Whatever is bound in, or bound in earth is bound in heaven. In John, he says, as the Father sent me, I now am sending you. And he received the Holy Spirit. And I am sending you, and now what you forgive will be forgiven in heaven. What you do not forgive will not be forgiven. Strong words. It's also important to note that Jesus is giving the authority to those who are his brothers and sisters, part of the household of God. That's important to notice. We don't give the keys, our keys that we use here on earth, to just anyone, right? We only give them to those that are trustworthy, close friends maybe, or a neighbor to take watch over our homes. In the same way, Jesus is giving the key of forgiveness, the authority of forgiveness to those who are going to be responsible to use them and trustworthy. You might also notice that he uses the multiple of key. He doesn't say one key, but he says keys. And I might be stretching it a little bit here, but I believe the reason he uses the multiple is because he's giving it to every believer, every one that is now part of his household, that authority. But also, I kind of put this in here, we're going to need those keys a whole lot to both ask forgiveness and to be forgiven, right? But with authority, which is what the keys represent, also comes accountability and responsibility. The concept of forgiveness is referred to by Jesus multiple times in the scriptures, and it is given as a command without excuses, which is why it is such an important part of the kingdom life that we all try to walk in. What Jesus is saying with the act of giving Peter and each one of us the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he's saying, I am now giving you the authority, the responsibility, and the command of forgiving others the same way you have been forgiven. That's the harder part, isn't it? We readily come to God asking for forgiveness, but it's much harder to do the forgiving. 
Jesus himself gave us the prime example as recorded in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. When they hurled the insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When Jesus was wrongly treated, he did not pay back. He entrusted what had been done to him for God the Father to judge in his time. So why do we need to forgive? Just as forgiveness of our sins protects us from the realms of the evil one, locks the door against him, so does forgiving others protect us and the body of Christ against the powers of the evil one. Listen to how Paul writes it in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, 26 through 27 and 29 through 32. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Did you hear the command? Unforgiveness or withholding forgiveness to others is a sin. We don't often think of it that way. This is why Jesus, I believe, Jesus included it in the prayer he taught his disciples, which we pray and just prayed every Sunday. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The as means just as I have received that forgiveness, I am now choosing to forgive others. The sin of unforgiveness hinders our experience of, and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I believe each one of us desires to have more of the fullness of Christ's Spirit and character in us, don't we? Jesus shared a uh, parable with his disciples when he was talking about forgiveness that again we're probably very familiar with about the unforgiving servant in which a servant came to his master who and he owed far more than he could ever repay and he pleaded with a master to forgive to let go of that debt and the master did fully forgive that debt that same servant then who was forgiven went to his servant who owed a whole lot less and he demanded payment but when his servant pleaded for forgiveness he refused to forgive and threw him in jail when the master then found out that he had treated his servant this way he threw the forgiven servant in jail I believe Jesus told this parable to help us to understand the seriousness of unforgiveness, but also the power of forgiving those that have offended us. With all the hatred that we see around us right now, in the world around us, even sadly in our homes and in the churches, we need forgiveness more than ever. So I've given you a lot of scriptural reasons for forgiving, but I want to give you an analogy that maybe touches a little, that we can relate to a little closely to home. I ask you this question, what if you knew that there is a thief, a murderer, someone with evil intent lurking in the neighborhood, your neighborhood. 
Would you leave the home when you go out unlocked? And more seriously, would you leave the door unlocked at night and leave your family unprotected? I think each one of us readily would say, no, we would make even a greater effort to lock the door to protect our home, our family. Do you realize that in scripture, Satan is called deceiver, plunderer, murderer, thief, liar, and a roaring lion seeking, seeking who he may destroy. He is lurking at the door. We're given the freedom and the authority and responsibility to use the keys of forgiveness, to loose the sin, to lock the door against our enemy. But we also have been given free will to choose not to forgive, to continue to hold that sin against the others. But by choosing the latter, we may be paying a price far greater than we even realize. We've promised, even in the scripture in Matthew and other places, Satan cannot overtake or se separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. However, it doesn't mean that he cannot influence or damage the condition of the temple where God dwells, each one of us, or the body of Christ. As I've been preparing this message, I became aware each time we recite the Lord's Prayer that the words, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who are trespassed against us, are followed with the words, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Could it be that one of the major temptations of the enemy is to convince us that we have the right to withhold forgiveness by using all kinds of justifications, such as, I won't forgive until he or she comes to me to ask for forgiveness. Or that sin is just way too big. I can never forgive that. Or I'm just not ready to forgive. These are all justifications that we use that allow the enemy a foothold. Brothers and sisters, we can't fix the hatred of that world around us. But we can by using the keys that God has given us, protect our own spiritual life in the kingdom of God and the life of the body of Christ. Forgiving others means letting go of the sin that they have committed against us. No longer feeling the right to pay back evil for evil, to hurt them the way they hurt us. I believe unforgiveness is part of the old sin nature. It is not part of Christ's nature, as we have seen. So I ask you the question, do you carry a hurt that happened maybe years ago, maybe even as a child, or maybe last week, or maybe even this morning? Or, and you've really struggled to let go of that, to forgive that individual. Or maybe it's a sin that you have committed and you have never been able to go to God and to receive the forgiveness he's given you first. You have kept yourself hostage to that sin. Now I realize there are many factors that do complicate forgiveness. 
post-traumatic stress disorder complicates it because it tends to trigger the, the difficulty when we've gone through the trauma. But also, there's many misperceptions and confusing things that are said about forgiveness. And so that all complicates it. And I can't go into all those now, but a few years ago, God led me to write a book, Abiding the Joy of Our Salvation. And I have a chapter on forgiveness in there. And that includes some of the misperceptions that we hold about forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this morning you didn't hear this Maria, your sister in Christ, that you hear God's Spirit speaking to you. And in a moment, we're going to take a time of just coming before God in prayer to allow the Holy Spirit to seek, seek our hearts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, first of all, we thank you for the incredible gift through Christ's shed blood that we are cleansed. All our sins are forgiven, past, present, and even future. That is, is through his sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins that we have full entrance to, into your kingdom and that we are fully protected, sealed from the ravages of the enemy. I pray now that you would speak to our hearts. If there is anyone at all that we have had difficulty forgiving, or even ourselves, that we can come to you and ask forgiveness or forgive forgiveness. In your bulletin, I have included a prayer and as the praise team is going to quietly sing or softly sing, I surrender all. I would like you to take a time, just come before God and allow him to search your heart. See if there is anyone that you have struggled to forgive. And you can use this prayer to pray, to offer forgiveness which means maybe including yourself. But I also put it in the bulletin because you might find that in the weeks to come, all of a sudden, God will lay someone on your heart. That was happening to me as I was preparing for this message. All of a sudden, God would bring to mind a situation, and I realized I had never really forgiven that person. So keep that prayer handy in your Bible or in your quiet time and as God lays someone upon your heart you can use obviously your own words but this prayer might help you let's go before God
Bless you.